Welcome. My name is Katherine Carney Feldman. I'm an Ipswich resident and I'm also a member of the Conservation Commission in Ipswich. Today's video is a presentation on inland wetlands and it's being presented by the Ipswich Conservation Commission. Today to describe that interesting and sometimes complicated subject is Mike DeRosa of DeRosa Environmental Consultants here in Ipswich. Today we're going to start this presentation with the all-important million-dollar question, what is a wetland? A wetland under the Wetlands Protection Act, which is a state regulation, is divided into two general areas, coastal areas and inland areas. And so what we're going to focus on today is the inland wetlands. Um, in the inland wetlands, there are also several different types. Uh, primarily, they're associated with vegetation and soils and hydrology, which is the surface water. So those are the things we'll focus on today. Well, both you and I, Mike, know that wetlands have not always been valued for what they have offered not only us, our ancestors, and all inhabitants, all creatures that live in it. In fact, it was not until 1972 that the Wetlands Protection Act was passed here in Massachusetts. And that was actually at the instigation of the representative from Ipswich, John Dolan, that got that act into effect. And we really have a lot to thank him for. Since then, we've learned so much about the wetlands and we've learned so much about the value. The Wetlands Protection Act actually comes up with eight values of wetlands and I'd like to go over with our audience some of those values right now. The first value I that the Wetlands Protection Act defines is protection of public and private water supply. Wetlands function in that capacity because they're recharge areas for water supplies. So when rainwater precipitation finds its way into our lowland areas, our wetland areas, that area then recharges the groundwater, which then becomes our water supply in the future. So they're very important in that capacity. The next one is protection of the groundwater supply. Again, it's, it's another recharge function where water gets into our, our groundwater. It is cleansed by the vegetation, by the soil microbiology within the wetland area. And it, it, uh, it functions to process that water and clean that water so that it then goes on to water supply and becomes potable. And related to that, of course, is flood control. Flood control is very important, as we talked about earlier. Uh, flood storage, again, recharge to groundwater. And here on the coast, certainly storm damage protection. Right. Again, it's this flood storage capability where we have severe storms, the severe runoff water from all the impervious surfaces around the, the town flows into these lowland areas, these wetland areas, and is stored instead of creating erosion and sedimentation of other areas. And then, we and then we go on to prevention of pollution. Pollution again, both by not only plants processing the runoff waters, a lot of our runoff waters from the roads and, and parking lots have oil and grease in them, metals, any manner of contaminant. Um, wetlands are very good at processing that contaminant. Um, the bacteria in the soil metabolize that. Plants take that up into their tissue and sequester that. Um, it's all, you know, it all functions to that end. In fact, there's quite a few plants that are in the wetlands that they actually hold the toxins in their roots. Exactly right. There's a whole science called phytoremediation where we're using plants to process contaminants, principally metals, in our hazardous waste sites around the state. Again, Ipswich, we have something very special here, our shellfish industry. And wetlands have a lot to do with the protection of the land containing shellfish. Absolutely. Fisheries are one of the primary uh, functions of wetlands. And 
and protecting water quality again. Again, more our coastal marshes in the Ipswich area uh, for shellfish, but uh, salt marsh is very important for that. Also, and related to that is the protection of fisheries. Again, the same thing. Uh, freshwater fisheries, our warm water fisheries, our trout, game fish, um, herring runs, which we're starting to restore in town, uh, are all uh, associated with wetlands, riparian areas, rivers. Um, and these inland wetlands filter that water that end up in those rivers. So they're very important in that capacity. And then, of course, we have to remember that this entire environment happens to be the home to many species. And this environment is here to protect those species. Absolutely. Wildlife habitat is one of the primary functions of wetlands, um, both in the canopy, which is the tree species, the shrub species, and the herbaceous species. They're all functioning in different capacities for food, for cover, for nest sites, for wildlife habitat generally. Well, we're going to be covering that interesting and sometimes a little complicated subject here at Dowbrook Conservation Area. We're right on Route 1A and 133, next to the famous White Farms ice cream stand. And Mike and I want to invite you to in come with us and enjoy a wonderful walk through the Dowbrook Conservation Area. Great. Well, here we are before our walk begins and before we start on the boardwalk here, there's a nice sign here. And this actually gives you a few of the rules and regulations when you're going to come down to Dowbrook Conservation Area for you to follow. Mike, would you like to talk about them? Uh, the first one is no motorized vehicles. Off-road vehicles are becoming uh, an important impediment to uh, maintaining the function and value of our wetland resource areas. Um, Off-road vehicles, ATVs, are, find it fun to be running through our wetland areas. And as a result, they create damage to these areas and are not helping in the, uh, in the functions and values these areas provide. Um, no unleashed dogs, which means that, that we can have dogs on leashes, so you can walk your dog through here. They just need to be leashed at all times. We have white-tailed deer populations in here. We don't want loose dogs chasing deer and other, other wildlife. Um, and then no horses on the boardwalk in the wetlands. But I believe there are trails on the other side of this area that connect to uh, equestrian trails. So there is definite use of, of the trails by uh, horse riders and equestrians. Actually, there are two trails that equestrians can enter Dalbrook Conservation Area, and one is west of the parking lot and the other is north. The only thing that Dalbrook is asking you here is for horses not to use the boardwalk, but there's plenty of maintained trails throughout the conservation area. Conservation area, I believe, is about 60 acres altogether. It's a large. It's a very large conservation area. Yeah. Well, here we are. We're right in the middle of Dow Brook Conservation Area, and we're overlooking a vernal pool. The main question is, how can you tell when you are in a wetland? And it's really pretty simple. You look at the vegetation, there's certain vegetation, certain plants that you're going to find in a wetland, and the other thing is you look at the soil. There's certain type of soil. Both the plants and the soil have to do with water. And with that, I'm gonna give the mic to Mike, and he'll tell in detail what exactly that means. Uh, the boundary of wetland resource areas is, is probably the beginning part of, of any permitting process or any, any application that some, a homeowner would make to the Conservation Commission for a project they were working on. So finding the boundary of where that wetland is is one of the first steps that has to get done. Um, in the preparation of your application. So, as Catherine said, as you said earlier, it's based in Massachusetts on, on vegetation and soils. And where those wetland plants transition into an upland plant community is where that, that change happens. So, when we go to a site as a wetland scientist, we look at different, the different plant communities. 
I always like to start with the canopy because it's, it's the trees are a larger root system. They're a more robust plant. It gives me sort of a sense of, of where we are. Here you can see the large white pines, which are upland species, transitioning right into the red maples, which is a wetland, classic wetland species. Then I go to more refinement with the shrub layer, and then I end up at the uh, herbaceous layer. And, you know, we have to assess all three of those layers when we do our, our boundary determination. Soils are another criteria that we look at. And um, soils change. Soils that are in contact with water all the time, as in wetland soils, have different, a different morphology, a different look, a different color, a different, um, different features compared to an upland soil. And in a minute, we'll go do a soil probe and show you some hydric soils. Well, but while we're in the middle of this, we can certainly talk about the plants and the fact that any plant that you're going to find in a wetland has a very unique characteristic. Do you want to talk about that, Mike? Well, certainly wetland plants are adapted to life and making a living within an area that there's not a lot of oxygen. Um, wetlands tend to be anaerobic environments, areas without oxygen. Um, and so they're specially adapted to do that. Their root systems are able to take in what little oxygen there is. They, they use different things to metabolize the nutrients and are able to, to process that information. Well, would it be worthwhile to look around here, see what we've got, and let our audience know some of the more common plants that you see and trees, shrubs, and a wetland? Absolutely. So one of the uh, things we wanted to talk about was the specific plant species that are seem to be dominant within this wetland area. And red maple is the dominant uh, wetland canopy, canopy tree in really New England. It's a classic uh, wetland canopy species. We also have an American elm here, uh, which is also adapted to life in wetland areas. A couple American elms, actually. Those are the dominant um, canopy species. The dominant shrub species in this area are the sweet pepper bush. Uh, we have high bush blueberry in here, and a lot of common buckthorn, which is an invasive species that is starting to dominate a lot of the fringe of our vegetated wetlands. And then herbaceous species, we have a lot of jewelweed, which is a very important uh, herbaceous species for the migration of the the monarch butterfly. In fact, the monarch butterfly could not migrate until three different plants, herbaceous plants, come out in the fall, one of which is the jewel weed. The other two is your golden rod, and the other is the New England aster. When the monarch sees all three of those, it knows it's time to go south. So we're just approaching that time now, and the jewel weed's just coming into flower. Um, what else do we have? Uh, sensitive fern is a dominant fern here in the herbaceous layer. And we have a lot of uh, beggar's lice, um, which is a sort of a native invasive. It tends to take over. Water whorehound is another herbaceous native that's here, as well as bone set. And Mike, before we leave the boardwalk area, we're standing right here, and the sign says vernal pools. Now, you and I both know that vernal pools are a very unique feature of inland wetlands. Would you like to talk a little about what a vernal pool is? Thanks, Catherine. Yeah, vernal pools are very unique habitat uh, in the northeast here. And in our area, we have certain species that only breed in these areas in the early spring. Uh, Yellow-spotted salamanders, mole salamanders, and uh, wood frogs are the dominant species that utilize vernal pools up here. Um, this area has wood frogs in it in the springtime. Uh, Catherine and I are going to be doing a, a separate unit uh, that is just about vernal pools this coming spring. And so we invite you to look forward to that next film and learning lots about vernal pools at that time. Uh, we talked earlier about the vegetation component of defining the boundary of the wetland. Um, soils are another criteria that we use uh, to confirm uh, at a micro scale where we are. Um, so this is a hand auger. Uh, it goes down. We can go down about 28 inches. 
and we'll go down to what we're looking for. Soils profiles are set up as a A horizon, which is the first organic portion, then a B horizon. And it's the B horizon that we're looking at. Um, and what we want to see is sort of a gray color, which is uh, indicative of a hydric soil. Bright colors, more yellows and, and oranges, are more indicative of upland soil. It'll be interesting to see what we get today. You can hear that slushy sound, which is a good, great, great sound. Good indicator of uh, wetland. Uh, this is the top top layer, which is a very nice black organic silt. You can feel some mineral in there, but you can also feel a very cr it's a very creamy texture, which is indicative of an organic silt, which is a wetland wetland soil. This is all the A horizon, and we would measure the depth of this. And but what I want to do is get down to the B and show you what is behind its soil. And you said, how far do we have to go down before we get to B? Oh, well it's it changing varies. already. It varies yeah. all the time. So here, what we look at, we have a Munsell color chart, which I can show you in a second. Um, but again, we have more organic silt. And you're not going to be able to see this on the camera, but you can see all these um, sort of like an orange tint color. Right, I can see Reductimorphic. That features they're called it's where in a wetland the water level rises and then falls and as it falls it brings oxygen into the soil pores and that creates an uh, oxidation reaction with the soil chemicals and that's why we get sort of these rust blotches which used to be called mottles and now they're called reductimorphic features um, I'm just gonna go down one more more. So it looks like you're down about a foot and a half right yeah. now. Yeah. And Again, here the you color can is see changing. colors changing. So it's a very muted. You can see these gray blotches. Those are reduced areas. And this would be considered a hydric soil. Um, Just based on that color change and that type of color. Actually, based on the organic silt on the mm -hmm. surface, it would be it would be called a hydric soil. And these chemical changes, these these redox areas. Can you catch that orange? That's indicative of a yeah. Good. So this would be considered a wetland location, and we'd go further up to find an upland location. And I think that's what we're about to do. Okay, here we are, and we hope that this is an upland area, and Mike's going to show us the difference in the soil sample that he's going to be pulling up. So we've gone down another section to the B horizon, and you can see here how the soils are brighter oh, definitely and less difference. reduced, so they're more more in the yellow range. Do and what is this indicative of? What is this? This is a... Um, is it clay? It's, or? A, it's probably a silty sand, I mm -hmm. would call it. And um, this is the book we use. It's a Munsell color chart. And we typically look in the 10YR page. I can see that this book has been used often with it very muddy hands. It's <laughs> time for new shifts. <laughs> but what we look for is, is we match this color, and we should be looking at it in a bright sun. But you can see that we're up in the high ends of the yellows. So this would be like a 6-6 six, six or maybe a 6-4. Um, but either one, the, the further... The brighter you are in your color, the more upland soil you are. Our wetland soils are down in this zone. And we were up in here. So this is clearly an upland soil. And so we the could wetland boundary right. would be between the two sites. Which goes to show you there's really no big yellow line dividing the uplands from the wetlands. Definitely a zone. Uh, definitely a zone.
and we're going to go to another zone. Here we are at another sign at the Dowbrook Conservation Area. And one of the great things about Dowbrook is that there's lots of signage. And it ex really explains what you see around you and how important the environmental features are. Here, this one says, how are uplands important to vernal pools? Um, as we'll discuss in our subsequent section on vernal pools, uplands are the most, probably, the vernal pool itself is very important because that's where reproduction occurs. But these species are only in the pools for about 5% of their, their lifespan. The rest of their time, they're in the upland areas. And it's those areas that need to be protected as well as the vernal pool areas. We'll talk about that in much more detail in, in our future section. If you find yourself so fortunate to have a wetlands near where you live, or even on your property, consider yourself lucky indeed. Not only do you get a front row seat to enjoy the richness and fullness of nature in this very singular and priceless ecological environment, but you also get to enjoy its unique diversity of trees, bushes, and flowers, as well as its enthralling wildlife, including birds, amphibians, and mammals that can only live within this special environment. So take a walk and spend some time observing this wonderful wet world. Once you understand and appreciate what a priceless treasure a wetlands is, you will want to protect this wonderful resource for the next generation. The best way to protect the natural world is to spend some time in it.